Good morning or good afternoon or good day to everyone who is joining us here today. Welcome to this episode of Social Studies Online from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. We are so thrilled to have you join us today for our episode on Women's History Month. My name is Abby Fischer. I'm an education specialist at the museum and I'm thrilled to be joined by several colleagues today. But before I hand it over to them, I want to again welcome you all and welcome you to the conversation. Whether you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube live, uh, we invite you to ask questions using the comment function. And if you're watching this later on, please know that those comments are available. You can see those questions. And we always encourage you to join us through email as well. And I will post our email in the chat section in just a moment. As we discuss, we ask you to remember we're all in a shared conversation and to keep it respectful and civil as we discuss this vital history. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Orlando. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Abby mentioned, we are focusing on Women's History Month and women's history issues today. And we are very fortunate to be joined by a couple of guests today, and we'll speak with them individually first, and then together um, on our way out, and we're just trying to figure out who said what with regards to women's history. And our first guest is Hayaloha Johnston, and um, welcome, Hayaloha. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm I'm great. Thank you, Orlando. How are you? I'm all right. Well, folks, for those of you who don't know, Hello is actually in Hawaii right now. And so it's very, very early. And we're very, very appreciative of her taking the time to be with us today. But given that context, uh, Hello, can you please share a little bit about the work that you do, um, sort of, as well as the road that brought you to Smithsonian? What were some of your research and projects that you did beforehand that you're now carrying with you in your current role? Thank you. Yeah, I was um, I was hired through the American Women's History Initiative, and I work at the Asia Pacific American Center. So I am the uh, curator for Asia Pacific American Women's Cultural History, and it's quite an honor to be a curator within this team, researching um, the incredible contributions and contemporary experiences of um, descendants from across Asia and the Pacific who continue to live in the Pacific and on the continental US. And my research often connects visual culture and art history from the past to the present. So I like kind of connecting dots. Very cool. All right. Thank you again for being with us and for sharing a little bit about your, your work. Um, is there a particular project that you're working on right now that could give us a heads up about to, to keep in mind and to look it out, keep an eye out for? Um, well, what I will say is that at APAC, we are working on creating an Asia Pacific American galley for the Smithsonian. It's deep in the pipeline, but for a curator, you know, five years in the future is like right around the corner. And so that's one of the long range projects that we're working on. Very cool, very cool. Thank you. All right, we are going to turn our attention a little bit to a couple of artifacts that you brought to share with us. Okay. Um, and before we do, I uh, have a, a, a quick question. Mm -hmm. well, can you share a little bit about the thinking behind, you know, how you, how you decided on these two objects? And then we're gonna practice a routine of visual observation and analysis when we look at the first one. Okay, so I selected these two pieces because I think they will be familiar to a lot of people, and yet they're very different. And I think there's there's an interesting contrast to the thinking behind the two pieces by the, the makers and the, the agencies behind them. And then I like to kind of look at them from like the view of the present and look back and say, okay, so what was you know, what were the limitations, what was achieved through these kinds of, um, through the visual production. Okay. All right. So here is our first one. I'm going to hide this information. I will share a little bit with our viewers how to operate the, the, form, the platform that we're using, which is Learning Lab in a second. But we're going to do a routine called looking 10 times two. And so what this entails is visually observing a an artifact, usually it's art, portraiture, or an image of some kind. And I'm gonna ask you um, to please highlight 10 observations that you make about this piece. So what are, as you look at it, what are the 10, 10 observations that you make that stand out right away? 
Okay, so this is a quilt. It is a flag quilt. And so there are one, two, three, four Hawaiian flags. The quilter um, reproduced the flags accurately. So there are eight stripes in the Hawaiian flag representing the eight main islands. And they go in exactly that sequence, white, red, blue, which oftentimes quilters will adjust the sequencing of the, the stripes in order to create the visual effect. So oftentimes quilters take liberties with the flag. In this case, the quilter was um, just kept it consistent with the, the structure of the flag. Um, the coat of arms is what's at center. And there you go. And that is the coat of arms. The coat of arms that's rendered is the version that was established during King Kalakaua's reign. And you can tell that because what looks like kind of like a curtain in the background mm -hmm. that has the monarch, um, the, the crown up at top. That's right. Um, it is during King Kalakaua's era, he changed what was previously more like an ahu'ula to be an ermine cape so that it would be more identifiable to the world as a symbol of royalty. And then the figures, the twin figures who flank the sides are facing outward instead of inward. And so um, he made those changes to the, the royal coat of arms um, during his reign. And then above the coat of arms, you're seeing Hawaii Pono'i, which was, which is the Hawaii national anthem. Again, that was written during King Kalakaua's era. So a lot of the symbols that we're seeing here are definitely representative of a particular moment in time. Um, is like a very contemporary piece, I guess is what I'm saying, right. is at the time of its making, this was a very contemporary piece. Um, and then beneath it, that is, there you go, the words right underneath. So that was um, a motto. It's now a motto, but it was a statement that was delivered by King Kamehameha III in a speech after the Lord Paulette affair. And it means that the, the life and sovereignty of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many how many observations I've made at this point. Um, I've probably missed some very obvious things. It's red, white, and blue. Um, the Hawaiian flag includes the the London Jack, and people often yeah. ask why that is, and it's because Hawaii had a very close relationship with Britain. Britain and France were the two first countries to recognize Hawaii as an independent country, and so Hawaii maintained a very close relationship with Britain over time. With England, yeah. Well, uh, you, you probably so the, so the routine is ten times two, but I think you did that all in one fell swoop, and you gave us twenty, and that's good. Um, <laughs> and, and we can sort of talk about the story of the quilt um, more generally now. So, can you say a little bit about how this would be connected, or the connection that is exists between this quilt and and our topic of women's history today? Yeah. So, women were women often made these quilts. Quilting was introduced to Hawaii by missionary women and um, Hawaiian ali'i and Hawaiian women picked it up very um, easily and started making quilts and developed though their own visual language for these quilts. And so the flag quilt, they did exist before um, the overthrow of the monarchy. But in 1893, when Queen Leo the queen of Hawaii was overthrown, you started to see the production of these flag quilts mm. on a scale at which was unprecedented. And it, you know, what I think is amazing is like, these were not only symbols of protest against annexation to the United States, but they were also an assertion of a, of a very clear um, Hawaiian national identity that women assumed and that women projected. And so these were like large scale works of art, really. I mean, most of them are like 90 inches at least because they were meant to be the size of a bed. And so these are not like small little pieces. These are like magnificent, um, hugely scaled works that were often displayed rather than put on a bed. So can you imagine the kind of space this would take up in a home to have something this big? 
And they were not necessarily made for one's own home, but they were gifted. So this was a gift to someone on their wedding day. And so can you imagine like the amount of work that would have gone into this on behalf of the maker to then give this to another woman and for that woman to have this in her home? Mm-hmm. And, and this the incredible statement that this would make. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's, it's a very powerful political statement. And it's also, I think, an incredible testament to the kind of um, care and work that women paid um, to the kinds of things that, that they lived with. And, and this was like no simple feat, in my opinion. Oh, no, that's intricate. So I've, you know, I'm not a quilter myself, but I, I know people who do quilt. And yes, this is an intricate, it's an intricate pattern as it, <laughs> in, in, the, in the quilting parlance. And I mean, that's, I appreciate the context you were providing in that this is, this blows my mind that this was a wedding gift. Like, hey, here's a political statement I'm making so that you can continually make it in your marriage. That's, that's fascinating to me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you for sharing the story of this quilt and for helping us analyze it and think through it. We're gonna turn to another artifact you brought with us and we're gonna look at it again. And for folks who um, are not familiar with Learning Lab, anytime you see an eye here, you can press it and it'll give you some more information and detail about the particular tile you're looking at. And you can navigate here at the bottom using these arrows and zoom in as well. So. Hey, Aloha, what are 10 observations that you make right away when you look at this particular image? So the first observation I make is this like monumental Hawaiian hula dancer in the background. Um, she's the central figure. And then I notice that there's a seated figure next to her. In fact, there's two, but the man is sort of disguised. He's like pushed to the, the very, very background. Um, there's a female ukulele player who's seated next to her. Um, There's a surfer, if you look to the other side, there you go, there's a surfer. Um, So this is really like an incredible collage of all these motifs. It's, it's, you know, there's a surfer on the water, there's a hula figure um, dancing, there are seated musicians. And then interestingly, there are these two pineapples like emerging out of, these leaves that look almost like in parallel to the two seated figures as though to reference they are as indicative of the land as the people are. Um, And then this whole mural sets a backdrop for this experience that two people are having. And so I see a woman and a man dressed up, very dressed up. I think the man is in coattails and there you go. And then, um, the woman is wearing a beaded necklace, maybe pearls. She's got a bejeweled brooch at the center of her neckline. She's got it on a bracelet. They're, they're dressed up in very formal attire and in their hand is a cup of juice. And if you read the ad, then you come to realize that it's a promotion for Dole pineapple juice. So these people are, are you know, having this very luxurious experience with juice. Again, I don't know how many observations I made. The ladies wearing a red dress, they're sitting on an orangey couch. <laughs> no, I mean, again, far more than 10, and that's okay. That's wonderful. I, I'm, I appreciate your descriptive language, both as someone who, pre, who likes to think about art, but also as a former language arts teacher, I'm like, wow, this is very descriptive language. Hey, has done this before. <laughs> this is very good. Um, well, can you tell us the story about this? Why did you select it? Um, and, and, you know, what do we make of literally the the the, um, the background that, that I'm assuming we're going to focus on a little bit here? Mm, yeah, thank you. So interestingly, the primary consumers that this ad was targeting was women as well. This came out of an issue of women's home companion. And so, you know, this ad though was not likely to have been made by women. The mural certainly wasn't. It was a male artist um, who, um, Buck Buck Ulrich, who painted the mural in the background. But the, the target audience was women. And the narrative here was not just a narrative that was promoted through one um, 
plantation, Dole Plantation, or one company, Dole Pineapple Juice. But this was a narrative of what was um, a very early attempt to stitch Hawaii to the United States. And that narrative was that Hawaii is this place that is both exotic but safe, um, different but similar, and um, that Hawaiian people and the Hawaiian land and the Hawaiian culture can set this incredible backdrop for your very luxurious American mm. experience. Mm. And that kind of narrative was promoted through um, government mechanisms and plantation owners were very eager to support that narrative because they benefited directly by having access to the American markets. And, um, but what I see in this ad is, you know, this, the use of the Hawaiian woman as a hula dancer who then became, that became a trope of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, yeah, you, thank you for, for noting and sort of giving us some of the origins of, of this trope, this sort of like stereotype, right? Of like, this is come to symbolize, signify, not just Hawaii, but Hawaiian women in particular. Mm -hmm. um, can you say, you know, on our way out and as, you know, sort of like last parting words, what are some of the long lasting impacts of, as you mentioned, Dole, but other plantations on the, the uh, society and culture of Hawaii over time? Well, what I will say is when I look at this ad, I think it's, it, there, I see a lot of irony in it because this imagery was entirely pervasive and this narrative was wholeheartedly consumed. It was consumed not only in the US, but in Hawaii as well. And yet, unexpectedly, you know, years later um, in the 1970s, the mechanism, the, the medium as an art form of hula was what ended up perpetuating Hawaiian culture mm. in a way that was totally unexpected because in hula, the language was maintained, um, stories about Vahipana, sacred places, the ali'i, you know, our chiefs. And so hula and music is what actually um, became this incredible force within the Hawaiian Renaissance, which then took on this, it always had this political impulse, but then it, it completely grew into a whole nother movement that evolved political consciousness within Hawaii. And so I look at it and I think, wow, you know, here the, the stereotype of the Hawaiian hula dancer who's like there for people's entertainment and visual consumption ends up becoming this incredibly powerful force. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii like doesn't even look back, you know, mm -hmm. after the 1970s. And it was Hawaiian women who maintained you know, hula, who taught generations of hula within the mm. schools, basically set up this audience for an entire, you know, group of people who were then ready to like take up the Renaissance. And it was women who also led, you know, were key figures within the Renaissance. So I think, although there was a very different kind of like women audience for this ad, it, they're the role that the women who are depicted played later, it's like, it just looks so very different from the passive figure who is depicted as a hula dancer in the background here. No, thank, thank you, uh, Hello, for bringing these uh, resources to us and for telling the stories behind them uh, to us and to the folks who are viewing at home. And yeah, it's sort of, it's interesting the way you, you are leaving us the idea that, you know, something that was meant to be, you know, a trope that was, you know, on, on some level pejorative, then became sort of an, a, a vessel, an opportunity for folks to say, no, 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 like we're going to tell our own stories through this, and you don't know what this language is, <laughs> this visual storytelling language. So I think of times when people, you know, w are switched to a different language so that the people in the room who they're talking about don't realize what they're saying about them. Um, that's very powerful. So thank you, Heloa. Uh, we will say bye to you for now, but we'll see you in a few minutes. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, we are going to transition. I think this question just came up um, that Halo can answer when, when she rejoins us. But for now, we're gonna transition to our next guest, Liz Harmon. Liz, thank you for being with us this morning. Can you please share a little bit about the work that you do, your role as Smithsonian? And then we'll start talking about the artifacts you brought with us today. 
Yeah, thanks, Orlando. It's it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, so like Aloha, um, I was hired as part of the American Women's History Initiative. Um, and my position is located at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, where I'm a digital curator. And I create digital resources and exhibitions about the history of women in science at the Smithsonian. Um, so I'm situated at the Smithsonian Institution Archives because that archives holds records about the history of the Smithsonian itself. Um, and it's, you know, the Smithsonian's one of the nation's oldest kind of national science institutions. And so it's a really great place to be able to go through records um, and kind of dig into mm -hmm. this history about, you know, how women have worked in the sciences, um, what challenges have they faced, um, all of that. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, that was a bit of a preview that we're talking about women in the workplace and women in the workplace specifically with regard to science. Is that accurate? Absolutely. All right, so we've got our first resource that you brought to share. And this is a letter from Doris Holmes Blake. And one of our um, readers for our newsletter, and um, Abby, if you're able, please put the link in for folks who may want to subscribe to our newsletter and get some of these um, questions in advance or ask us questions in advance. The question was, who created this and when and who were the first women recognized? And if I'm interpreting this correctly, um, or for the reader, um, when were women, women recognized for their contributions to the government as a workplace? And if you could use that as an entry to talk about what is going on in this letter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll kind of start with this letter and, and kind of wind back and answer the question. Yeah. Um, so this particular letter, as you mentioned, was written by entomologist Doris Holmes Blake um, in 1934. Um, she was an expert on leaf beetles, um, actually. Um, and so she's objecting in this letter. Um, it's pretty concise. It's only, I think, two paragraphs, if I remember correctly. So mm -hmm. definitely <laughs> worth it, worth a quick read. It's concisely written and very powerful. Um, but she's objecting to her termination under um, the 19, what's kind of called the marriage bar legislation in 1932, um, which was included in the Federal Economy Act of 1932. So in a nutshell, um, during the Great Depression, um, states and the federal government enacted legislation that prevented married women from working, um, or in the case of this federal um, 1932 act, it required that the government fire one member of every married couple employed by the government. Um, and so <laughs> in this letter, Blake is writing to the Secretary of Ag Agriculture to protest her firing under this law. Um, and you know, this law was often, um, it was often women who lost their jobs because one of the reasons for that um, is, you know, they often made less money than their partner at that time. And this is the Great Depression. So if you're going to, if it's one person that's going to lose their job, it's often, often the wife in this case. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, it's important to say that even though Blake sent this really, you know, well worded, eloquent letter describing how in her family, they had mm -hmm. made a choice um, mm -hmm. that she would work, continue to work after they had kids. Um, that, and they needed the money as a family to kind of continue to support extended family and to make their, their own nuclear family work too. Um, you know, she didn't get her job back. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what ended up happening is she ended up working unpaid for the rest, yeah. most of the rest of her career. Um, which was pretty incredible. It was it lasted until 1978 at the Smithsonian. Um, and on top of that, um, when she lost her paid position, you know, the entomology department at the time at the Smithsonian um, decided there wasn't space for her to have a desk there anymore. So even though she continued to publish and continued to research, continued to do field work, um, she ended up working um, in the attic of the National History Museum on the mall. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, in in Blake's words, I mean, I think, you know, she really made the best of it. She acknowledged that the winters were freezing, the summers were hot, um, as you can imagine in DC. Yeah. Um, but she said it was quiet and it helped her get her work done. Um, you know, I have to mention 
Blake is, is one of these figures in Smithsonian history that really looms large. And, you know, one of the really wonderful stories about Blake is that she kept a pet lizard who was toilet trained in her drawer, <laughs> in her office. She, this lizard, I love it because I guess he would sit on a pile of books and just from the top of the Natural History Museum and watch people and buses. And then when he got tired around lunchtime, he would just climb down and get in a drawer and take a nap. Oh my. Well, so Liz, thank you for the the, the context of the story and well, it's it's horrifying, <laughs> I mean, but and it, it made me think of we have in, in American history we currently have an exhibit um, titled "All Work and No Pay," and it gets at a lot of the domestic labor that women, and and not just domestic, but in in the like quote unquote public workplace that women did unequally for unequal pay or didn't get paid at all, but to to this ratchet set up to a whole different level <laughs> that she did work unpaid for the rest of her career for years for Smithsonian producing knowledge, right? That, that we all are relying on and was not compensated for it. Um, and again, 1933 folks, that's, there are people who were born in that year who are still alive and with us today. It's not that long ago. All right, well, we're gonna turn to our, our next um, artifact and this one's a little bit longer. So I'm gonna let you sort of talk uh, and share the story about this with us. And if there are any particular sections that you would like us to highlight, please let us know. And it's gonna take a bit to, to load, but you can start letting us know the story of this letter. Great, great. Yeah, so the second letter um, is from 1924, um, and it was written by a botanist, David Fairchild, who was a prominent botanist at the time, um, who had a lot of kind of wealthy backers, um, who helped him do a lot of field research um, and bring back um, new types of crops and seeds to the United States um, to kind of introduce them to the public. Um, and so he's writing in this letter um, about why he believes that women should be barred from the laboratory um, on uh, Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama. And this is part of Smithsonian history because this particular um, island it became part of what is now called the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. So this history of who's done research there and who, you know, who hasn't is really relevant to Smithsonian history, especially to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Um, now, <laughs> so I, I want to just take a minute and do a little bit of close reading on the sure. last paragraph of the first page, um, just in case people can't zoom in or, or read it too closely. Um, but this letter is pretty amazing because it, it makes explicit, which is often implicit, right? Which is this kind of, it's beyond bias, um, but this kind of um, discriminatory thinking um, of why you don't want certain people in your space. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll start here. Um, I yeah, think no, and, and folks, please read this if you don't read it now, because it is mind blowing. <laughs> but Liz, thank you for highlighting what you're gonna highlight. Thanks, Orlando. Um, okay, so this is the last paragraph on the first page. Um, Fairchild has just opened kind of expressing an interest in Barrow, Colorado Island, kind of narrating its importance to potential, its research value potential. Um, so he says, I think the women ought to raise the funds for a women's dormitory contiguous to our laboratory, a separate institution entirely. Um, and then let me skip a little bit farther. I am, a, I am myself a married man and as fond of my wife as any man could be, but the question is not one of convenience. It is as to whether it is possible if we let women in to keep there at Barrow, Colorado, the one thing which to me is absolutely sacred. I do not believe the same curiously stimulating atmosphere can be maintained in a body of men and women that can be a, that could be in a body of men alone. My dear old father-in-law, Mr. Bell, and this is Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, mm -hmm. felt this impossibility and never admitted the women to his so-called Wednesday evenings because he discovered immediately that there was a spirit of deference to the ladies which distracted from the keen intellectual <laughs> sparring which took place at those remarkable evenings. To my mind, the most precious asset which we have in that laboratory is that intimate association, which it is possible for the men to have there now. 
um, we'll see, okay, I'll stop there. Yeah, Liz, can you translate what, what, what he's saying, please? Totally, totally. And I think, you know, that's the, in my mind, this is an incredible kind of document to do a close reading of because you could almost miss the like, truly, truly vile nature of what's being expressed here, right? Because it's expressed in terms that seem like you just want to promote the quality of scientific yeah. research and its rigor, right? Um, but what he's saying is he's laying out the reasons um, while he's in conversation with other prominent male scientists who do a lot of field research, that he's saying that if you let women into these field research sites, then you kind of corrupt the sanctity of these spaces for male researchers who, you know, this tra taps into some tropes we have today, right, of the kind of male ge genius who can mm -hmm. kind of do research in a unique way mm -hmm. um, through abstract thinking and make connections and this kind of process of discovery. Um, and so, you know, this word rigor this, that I keep using, I think, is part of that narrative. Um, it's to preserve this space as a male space so that you don't kind of corrupt it. Um, and, you know, there's multiple dimensions to this letter. You know, on the one hand, it's partly in response to male researchers sometimes bringing their wives on these trips. Um, oftentimes women would contribute to the research too, um, spouses in this period. Um, but another dimension is this letter was actually found by my colleague, Pam Henson, who's the historian of the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and she found it because she was doing research on um, a grasses expert named Mary Agnes Chase, who she knew had a lot of problems um, obtaining access to research sites and fundraising to do her field research. Mm. Um, and so she found this, Pam, Pam Henson found this um, while she was looking to kind of understand, right, why Mary Agnes mm -hmm. Chase was having all these troubles. Um, and, you know, again, I would just say this letter makes explicit what what so often isn't and what we kind of have to, you know, do work as historians and thinkers to kind of connect the dots where they might not, um, where there might be questions about, well, were women really barred or were they just discouraged? Yeah, yeah. no, that, yes, thank you. And I appreciate, Liz, your, the, your phrasing is that it makes explicit that which we implicitly know. Um, and we have a question in the chat that I think will help bridge our conversation to our last part together. I'm going to ask Kealoha to rejoin us and we're going to um, do a small little game called Who Said It? And to help us transition, I'm going to ask, I'm going to pose the question that our um, viewer posed, which is specifically was how much do women earn for a typical work day? But I, I feel like, Michael James, you're sort of getting at a sort of like a comparison. So can one of you sort of answer that question? How much do women get paid per day compared to men? And I'm gonna say for similar work. I guess, is there, is there any kind of like um, clarity around like historically or in a contemporary way or? Uh, let's go contemporary. Are, are, are either of you, or if, if it needs to be historical, that's okay too, but are either of you able to answer the, the comparison question? I was just gonna look up the exact um, figure of cents on the dollar that women right. make. <laughs> well, let's wait, Liz, because it's gonna come up in one of our quotes. All right, okay. so so all right, here, here are the, the rules. Uh, hey, Aloha and um, Liz, you all are gonna work together. I'm gonna present a quote on the, on the screen that is in some way, shape or form tied to our discussion today. And you all have a second to guess who it is and we'll see if you can identify correctly who said this thing. Does that make sense? All right, number one, never cease to act because you fear you may fail. Do we know Queen who Lee. said this? Queen Go ahead. Lee. That is correct. Can you share for viewers uh, a little bit about who this is and how it's connected to our conversation today? Yeah, so she was the queen who was overthrown and what um, that act you know, produced an outpour of action on behalf of the people of Hawaii to restore her to leadership because she was beloved. Okay. And that's uh, the, the, the flags, right? The sovereignty the movement mm -hmm. are coming out of yeah. this. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Our second quote for today. I told my pastor, when I die, I want him to be able to say at my funeral that I made a difference. I don't know who said this, but I am anxious too, because I love that. Okay. 
Liz, any any guesses? I don't I don't have any guesses. All right, that's quite all right. This was said by Lily Ledbetter. And uh, Lily Ledbetter is a former Goodyear employee who sued her employer because she was getting paid unequally uh, with to her male counterparts. And we have something called the Lily Ledbetter Act because of the actions of this woman. And to answer our viewer's question, we have this quote. You know, equality is a myth. And for some reason, everyone accepts the fact that women don't make as much money as men do. I don't understand that. Why do we have to take a back seat? Today, women make up half of the US workforce, but the average working woman earns only 77% of what the average working man makes. So if we're doing that as a dollar, 77 cents on the dollar. And mm -hmm. black women and Latino women earn less than that on average. But unless women and men both say this is unacceptable, things will not change. Do we have any idea who might have said this? A clue is this is this is also a woman and she is an entertainer. I mean Dolly Parton is getting so much so much great press right now. Not you know, Liz, that is a great guess. And it does sound like something uh, Dolly Parton would have said. Unfortunately, in this case, it was Beyonce. I was going to yes. guess Beyonce. Oh. Ah, so you always go with your gut instinct. I know. <laughs> oh, curators hate to be wrong, I'm telling you. All right. And our last quote for the day. Our story remains unwritten. It rests within the culture, which is inseparable from the land. To know this is to know our history. To write this is to write of the land and the people who are born from her. Now, I always will select like equally divided quotes tied to our two subject matters. So this one will definitely go back towards you, Hayaloha. Any idea who may have said this? No pressure, Hayaloha. <laughs> I, I, I don't know who said this. That's all right. It's how Nani K Trask. Oh yes. yes. Well, that's a that's a good quote from how Nani K Trask. All right. Well, thank you both for being with us today. Um, the other question that did come that did come up in the chat was with regard to the the Dole pineapple ad. Oh. What kinds of magazines would that have appeared in? You mentioned one, but which other ones would have, you know, may have that ad appeared in? Um, so that, you know, those ads were produced in a lot of lifestyle magazines. So like the Saturday Evening Post and um, other kinds of like leisure magazines. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So we have a question there. Maggie, I see it. We will answer it after the fact. Um, but Heloha and Liz, thank you for your time and for sharing your work with us today. We very much appreciate it. For folks who are out there, the viewing this either live or later on, you can click on this link and it will take you to the learning lab that we just worked our way through. And please join us next week when we will be joined by a couple of experts and museum curators who are putting together an exhibit called Play Ball, which focuses mm -hmm. on Latinos in baseball. So thank you very much, Aloha. Thank you very much, Liz. And thank you for everyone being with us this morning. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Orlando. Thank, Thank you. you.